Hello, I'm your host, Kyrie Douglas, and welcome to Catalyzing Computing, the official podcast of the Computing Community Consortium. The Computing Community Consortium, or CCC for short, is a programmatic committee of the Computing Research Association. The mission of the CCC is to catalyze the computing research community and enable the pursuit of innovative, high-impact research. In this episode, I interview Eric Furlidge, a research scientist at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology who creates digital learning tools for photonics education. He is developing 3D virtual lab environments that allow users to interact with micron-scale photonic circuit components, enabling self-directed learning for the emerging photonics workforce. His research areas include integrated photonics, photovoltaic materials, and photoelectrochemistry. In this episode, we discuss building educational games and using games, virtual reality, and augmented reality for job training. Enjoy. Here today with Eric Verlage from MIT. How are you doing today? Very well. Very excited. So could you say a little bit about your background? You're currently at MIT. What do you do there? So I'm currently a research scientist here at MIT, And I'm working on creating educational software, mostly for photonics education and online learning in photonics and optics. So what what are photonics for people who don't know? So photonics is the study and use of photons. Uh, So there are many different uh, technologies that use photonics. So it's the creation of photons and the use of photons in matter and then the capture of photons in photodetectors. Uh, So whereas in optics, you might think of it as more of the kind of uh, sending light through a lens, uh, Mm. photonics is when you start to use photons and the the properties of photons on the micron scale, sending signals around on a in an optical circuit or through optical fiber or uh, LEDs or or any of these other devices that are using the properties of photons on the, the nano or micron scale. Okay. So these tools you're developing are to help train people that that build photonic systems. Right, right. So we're trying to train both engineers and technicians. Our field specifically is integrated photonics. So we're trying to train engineers to create and to uh, design integrated circuits that include optics and photonics on the circuit uh, level. So these are photonic devices that use photons instead of electrons for optical computing. Okay. So how did you get involved in this space? Did you do research in photonics previously? So I actually came over from photovoltaics. So my my research was originally in photovoltaic applications. I was creating anti-reflective coatings for photovoltaic cells. Uh, And I was also working on solar fuels. So we were working on absorbing light in semiconductors and then using that uh, voltage that's created when, when you absorb light to split water into hydrogen and oxygen. So we were we were using the energy from the sun in order to perform chemical reactions inside of our device. Interesting. And so how did you get involved in computer science generally? Originally, I, when I was a high school student, I actually uh, competed in the Mexican Computer Science Olympiad, the Olimpiada Mexicana de Informática. I grew up in Guadalajara, so I was, I was uh, part of a network of American schools. I, I went to school at the American School Foundation of Guadalajara. There are a few different types of competitions that our school was involved in. There was a programming competition. There was a media competition. And we were able to uh, travel to many different areas of the country to participate in these national competitions around computer science or other types of uh, content generation and media. And I found that to be quite enjoyable. Uh, so when I went to, uh, on to undergrad, I while I was getting my uh, degree in physics, I was also doing a few internships, creating educational media and educational software at the MIT Media Lab. So I, I was uh, working on sociometric badger, badges and creating games that use biometric feedback to help autistic children recognize social cues. Okay. How did those kind of games work? That sounds pretty interesting. Right, right. So for sociometric badges, we were trying to gather data from the employees of a business in order to analyze their behavior, who interacts with who, and trying to figure out from their interactions what type of networks are created within an organization. We were working on a speech recognition software that would, that would be recording useful f- information without actually recording the, uh, the actual uh, voices of the, of the participants. So we were, okay. we were trying to analyze that information. Uh, later in a, in, a, in a second project I did at the MIT Media Lab, we created educational games that 
we're using biometric feedback to help autistic children understand social cues. So we would record the feedback from people who were experiencing a social situation and use digital displays in order to help autistic school children recognize that a social interaction is, ha is, is occurring and give them more of a sense of like who's happy and who's sad in a, re in a relationship as it progresses. So we were trying to create games that would help autistic children make those connections. Okay. So could you talk a little bit about the history of MIT's work on, in virtual reality and, and learning technologies? Uh, so MIT's been involved from the very beginning, especially at the MIT Media Lab. There, there have been uh, many different groups that have been working on VR. And so I can't uh, really give you a, a good sense of the, the <laughs> overall co contributions of MIT to, to the field, but uh, I can say that uh, they were on the leading edge in, in many of these uh, new technologies that were coming on the market both in terms of developing the technology and also working on how that technology is being used. Recent example of a project that the MIT Media Lab has been focusing on, they've been trying to solve the problem of avatars in VR normally don't have much emotion. So you have these emotionless avatars walking around. Uh, so one of their recent projects are trying to use uh, biosignal sensors uh, in head-mounted displays to gather data about the emotional state of the user and then uh, use that to create what they're calling an emotional beast, an avatar that has the emotions of the wearer and that is expressive in order to make it so that the users within a digital environment are not so <laughs> blank-faced and walking around with fewer social interactions. We're, they're trying to make it much more lively and much more like real life. Okay, interesting. So they're scanning these faces in real time to then project into whatever virtual or augmented reality is occurring right it takes both hardware and software to make this happen so you have to have hardware that can detect the emotional cues that are given off by facial features and by uh, sometimes you'll also use bioreceptors you'll be able to tell the conductance of the someone's skin to see if they're whether they're calm or uh in a state of stress there are many different ways and you can also tell from heartbeat and, and other bio signals from from the sensors that you put onto the body you can tell things about the user at that point, you want to analyze all of the data coming in and be able to create a useful uh, emotional state for the user that you then display in the avatar. Hmm. Obviously, this is still just sort of research, but do you see any sort of applications in the field you're working in for a technology like that? So I think in general, with VR, one of the main problems, and this is not just VR, but uh, online learning in general, one of the major challenges that we have is how do you create communities of people and how do you create social interactions that are beneficial to both parties who are, who are meeting each other online or trying to interact online? That's one of the areas that we've really failed to build the human element into these social networks. And so I think in terms of training tools and all of this, these uh, interactive spaces that we're trying to create, uh, these types of uh, emotional avatars that's something that is missing and that's not being utilized in our training tools at the moment. So this has applications in many different fields. Anytime you want to do online training or online learning, uh, this, is, this is an area that would be very beneficial. Hmm. So I know you also mentioned that the MIT Media Lab is working on something called the Clever Project. We are collaborators with the Education Arcade, which is a group on campus hmm. uh, that has multiple projects, mostly geared around game-based learning or creating uh, interactive environments that encourage playful learning or collaborative learning in groups. The Education Arcade is its own group on campus, and they have a, a project that they've been uh, spearheading called the Collaborative Learning Environments in Virtual Reality, or CLEVER project. Uh, and they're trying to explore what can VR do in the classroom. One of their most recent uh, games that they've been working on is called Cellverse. So this is a game where they want uh, students to explore a cell in a way that they haven't before, that they can only do in virtual reality. Uh, so one of the problems that, that they noticed early on is a lot of students, when they're trying to describe a cell or draw a cell, uh, they draw it in the way that their textbooks draw it. So they, they draw a cell with a ribosome and a mitochondria and a nucleus, and they put all the elements there, but it's very much a simple diagram. There's one of each type of, of organelle <laughs> And uh, when they're drawing these things, they you can tell that they're kind of regurgitating the data uh, that they were taught, and it, it's it's very much a, a kind of a standard template. 
And so the researchers on the Clever project really wanted to kind of push the envelope and see how can students actually interact with a real cell and start to understand how, like, how these organelles interact with each other and maybe uh, have a project that they're trying to solve as they, as they interact with the cell. So, so they created the Cellverse uh, uh, game, and it's a game where one student will be using the head mount and display, and they'll be inside of the cell. And then a second student will be guiding them through the cell and guiding them through different objectives using an iPad. They're definitely trying to create this as a teaching tool for use in the classroom so that students can gather around and, and watch other students be working in VR. One of the main things that they, they're discovering is if they test students before and after and have them draw cells before and after, when they're in the cellverse environment, they get to see a 360 view around them and see wow, there are many, many organelles, a lot of times all of the same type, just in the, in the three dimensions, they're, they're all around you. You can see how they're all interacting with each other in a very complex way. And this is a view that textbooks don't really get to. Even 2D screens, like there's something about exploring this for yourself and kind of seeing in three dimensions the, the expanse of all of these different organelles interacting with each right. other and how many of them there are and where they're situated in 3D space. There's something about that that is very powerful. Yeah, that makes sense. I can definitely see how that would, it would stick in your mind more. Um, are, there, are there unique challenges to building? Because you said that it's designed for one student to be in it and another student to sort of help guide them around and other students to watch. Are there challenges to designing something that can be used in sort of a group context as opposed to just one individual with one screen or one? Definitely, yes. Uh, so this is something that is actually a major design challenge for almost all the content that we're developing. A, a lot of times it, when people are making educational games, you have to go one of two routes. You either have to design it for use in the classroom or you have to design it as sort of an entertainment game or a game that's targeted on a different platform towards students or towards parents. Mm -hmm. So uh, the Education Arcade really does cater much of their work towards creating content that can be used in the classroom. And for that reason, they, they also keep in mind what does the teacher need to know or what does the teacher need to uh, see in this project in order to use it. So they create instruction guides for teachers and give them uh, feedback about how to use it in their classroom. There are many constraints that that, that, that puts on the designer. So you have to have the experience be something around 30 to 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. you, you can't have an experience that takes too long because they have to be able to accomplish something in the, in the class period. Uh, they have to be able to meet certain learning objectives or, or, or standards that they have to meet. Uh, it has to align with the curriculum that, that is set for our, our K-12 schooling system. So you, ha you ha definitely have to make sure that teachers can tell their superiors and, and, and tell uh, the, the school boards that they are meeting their educational requirements with this, with this learning experience. Right. Uh, and you also have to then make it fun. So whereas <laughs> with educational, with, whereas with entertainment games, you normally uh, only have to worry about, is it fun to play? And do, does it give you a rewarding experience? Here, because we're designing educational content that has to be used in the classroom, there are all these extra constraints on top of that you really have to advocate and make sure that you're not just creating what might be called chocolate covered broccoli. So a lot of times <laughs> with these uh, educational games, what ends up happening is that you find a way to make something that is educational and that is achieving your learning objectives. Uh, and that's the broccoli part. And then you cover it in chocolate. You put basically pour <laughs> entertaining game elements all around it <laughs> to try to entice people. Oh, look, it is fun to play. It is interesting to 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 uh, explore this space or to to play this game. But in reality, you've sort of separated out the educational activities from the game that's interesting and fun to explore. The real challenge is how to not make chocolate cover broccoli, but to actually create content that's the, where the interesting aspects of the game are tied directly to the learning outcomes or, or lead directly to the learning outcomes. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, so in working together, it seems like you'd have a lot of different people involved in this. Obviously, you have the people doing the more computer science part of designing the game, but also... Um, to some degree, visual artists and teachers, psychologists. What's what's sort of the process to bring all those people together into a collaboration? Right. Well, uh, game design and game development is actually extremely multidisciplinary. It's one of the more multidisciplinary uh, projects that you can work on. As you said, you have to have programmers who, and you have to have 
game designers and uh, instructional designers who are making sure that these interactive games and simulations are achieving what you want them to achieve. So in terms of the design process, a lot of times what you start with is you start by making a paper prototype. So you, you go through and you analyze what is it we want the game to achieve and what activities do we think are going to be part of the game loop, the main game loop that we want people to do over and over. Uh, and so once you start with a, an objective of what you want to accomplish, then you go to a, uh, the paper prototyping phase. And you basically just write on index cards and write down in, uh, on pieces of paper what you want, like the different uh, uh, states of the game, and then bring people in and, and you recreate what it would be like to play this digital game with paper and note, and note cards. <laughs> and so that, that experience is, is quite fun because you can change it on the fly even. If, so if you're trying to figure out what works best to have them have access to this tool or this feature early on, later on, you can make design decisions very, very quickly and, and test different ideas. So this whole rapid prototyping process can be done very quickly. And that gives you the flexibility to be able to change things on the fly and figure out what is the core thing that's fun about playing this game and, and also what is going to lead to the learning outcomes that you want. So then once you have paper prototyped the game and, and started the design process, now you have to bring in people with a whole background of expertise. So you have to bring in game developers or people who are programmers who are experienced in uni using these uh, game engines. And you have to bring in graphical artists. You have to start to create the art that will be in the game. And you have to bring in UI UX experts because a lot of times what you'll end up finding is that although your, your experience worked on, on paper and when you were able to move things around, there are always UI problems that pop up. <laughs> And you have to uh, even even the color that you choose for something might might affect how people see it and how people use it. Uh, so you have to bring in people who have that expertise to to uh, be able to design the UI, but also the user experience, and make sure that people are interacting with with the content in the way that you want. And then after that, don't forget you have to add sound effects. You have to add so there's all these different <laughs> uh, artists coming into play, and all of the content comes together in a, and makes something that's greater than than the separate pieces. So the whole ends up being a much more in, enjoyable and interactive environment than than you could ever have with everyone working separately. So yeah, this, this is a very interdisciplinary activity, and that's one of the most fun things about it is that it involves all these different fields. So you'll never be an expert in all of them at the same time. So you'll always need a large team to come together to create a really good game. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, obviously there's a lot of moving pieces here, so I guess maybe kind of a weird question, but um, I guess what happens if you get the game close to being done and you realize critical elements aren't working? Maybe, you know, cause it's an educational game, maybe some of the key objectives you thought would be there aren't really working out the way you had hoped or, Maybe it's not as fun as you thought it would be. So, like, you're worried people won't play it. Right. Yeah, yeah. That's always a risk that you run, uh, especially when you're trying to make an entertaining product. Uh, I guess it's similar to the uh, film industry. A good movie is hard. To, it's hard to just crank it out. You have to. It, it <laughs> almost takes a little bit of artistic inspiration of like what's good and what's not. There's no no correct formula to make something that will definitely be a great movie. It's it's some amount of intuition that you have to follow. And you have to take some leaps of faith in doing something new. Uh, so I think in general, because you're constantly going back to playtesting and beta mm -hmm. testing, you do get a sense of people are finding this fun or people are not finding this fun. But it's it's not as quantitative as you might like. You do have to kind of like sit there and look them in the eyes because <laughs> people, people will tell you, oh, yeah, it's great. But they, you can tell that they're actually not enjoying it. <laughs> or you have to like follow the, the, the scent of, oh, something interesting is happening here. They're actually engaged and interested in this part of the game. Uh, so there, there's always there's always some amount of artistic uh, interpretation of what's of what's happening and what's enjo what's enjoyable that the game industry definitely it, it, there are many games that flop because they just weren't fun to play so right. it's always it's always a risk <laughs> that you're running yeah um in this specific context you were talking a little bit about games being used in the classroom how easy is it to get that set up like i assume most school boards or whatever have pretty strict curriculum so how are you able to like insert yourself and and have this game available in biology class or whatever that's still an open question because, uh, as as you might know, if you have 
children, like games are not currently a standard thing to have in a curriculum. So we're still figuring out how do you incorporate these types of activities in, in the classroom setting. We've had more success in some fields and less success in others. Uh, it is a, uh, an open question of how, how, do you, how do you get them in the classroom? One thing for in the U.S. at least that's important is you need to you need school buy-in. Mm-hmm. You can't just cater to teachers because a lot of times the teachers are very constrained in how much time they have to uh, add new activities for students to do. Even though they would be very engaging and very very active learning, and even though they would have all these benefits, you still have to have school buy-in so that they give them those teachers the space and time to add those activities. So far, a lot of companies that are trying to create educational games have not been doing so well and and, uh, or they've been finding uh, not necessarily trying to push into the classroom. But those that have been making content that has been getting into classrooms, a lot of times they're doing it at this district level. They're 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 having buy in from someone who's in charge of many schools, who's Mm -hmm. able to push this content in and make sure that the teachers have the, the support that they need to use the content in their classroom. Okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So I did see a stat somewhere, and I I don't know how true this is, that was saying that the game-based learning industry will mount to over $17 by 2023. Uh, I couldn't really find anything to really back that up, but do you know, does that seem true? Is that something on the scale of what you're aware of? Well, I think learning games, it's been around for a long time. People have from really early on been trying to use learning games and trying to sell learning games to both schools and teachers and also to uh, individuals. So uh, I don't know if you remember, there was a DS game at one point, I think it was called Brain Age. (laughs) Oh, I do remember, yeah. Right. And so there have been multiple waves of of games being marketed towards adults and towards children. Uh, And we're in one of these new uh, these waves of, of of games being marketed heavily towards the end user. Uh, so there are many learning games that are coming up on the App Store and on and on Android and on different devices. One example is CodeSpark Academy. They're doing quite well in marketing simple games that teach very young children programming concepts using block-based puzzles. Uh, each block represents an action the character can take using only pictures and arrows, so no words. And students arrange the blocks to write a script or solve a puzzle. Uh, a lot of times, what the industry is trying to do is is trying to market itself as a way to keep yourself, keep your brain sharp, and keep your problem solving skills up to date. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you're not a psychologist, so if this is outside of your scope, so I've heard a lot of those games like Brain Age and stuff, but I've heard some disputed opinions on how good they actually are in terms of your ability to. To transfer that learning to other domains, how much of game-based learning is strictly targeted towards that game, or or at least the concept within the game, if it's say a math game? Right. Uh, so I think in in general, people have been disappointed in the past about learning games in in the in the past in past decades. Uh, but what we're starting to find, and this is a lot of work coming from Valerie Shute at Florida State University is showing that a lot of times those games that were maybe mismarketed as learning games were not actually as good as true games at increasing uh, human cognition. Mm -hmm. So her work was comparing the entertainment game Portal 2 to the leading educational apps and looking at time that people spent solving problems in Portal 2 and comparing that to time that's spent in other educational apps. So Valerie Schutz's work definitely did find that it was very effective solving problems with portals uh (laughs) not surprisingly like those those are some games that require that you that you really uh do think differently and that you train your brain to solve these types of puzzles so uh i think there's there's a difference between games that are kind of only on the surface really educational and those that are really using the content that they're trying to teach as part of the puzzle solving mechanic or as part of the core element of the game we're still on the, the very first stages of, of rolling out these types of games, but I, I think we're definitely finding that there are things that educational games are very useful in doing, that they are, they can be used quite effectively for a few specific areas, and we're only going to be discovering how they can be used in an ever-increasing way So going forward. So I, I think that in, in this case, 
educational games might be finally breaking through that barrier and, and having the outcomes that they claim they're having. Yeah, that'd be exciting. So backing away from games for a second, we'll, we'll probably come back to it a little bit later. You're part of a team that just got a new $5 million award. Could you talk a little bit about that project? Sure. So we, we recently received a grant to develop content for advanced manufacturing education. And this is a, a, a project that is a collaboration between MIT, Clemson University, and University of Arizona. And we are currently in the beginning stages. We just started in October. We're in the early stages of creating these interactive modules that are built around educational simulations and educational games. We have three separate thrusts of the, of the types of interactive content that we're creating. We're creating optics and photonics fundamental simulations. We're creating tool training VR simulations, and that's an area where Clemson University is taking the lead. And we are also creating application-focused educational games. And for the application games, that's an area where the MIT Education Arcade is bringing their many years of, of experience creating educational uh, games and, and uh, creating instructional material for teachers who are using these educational games. They're bringing all of that uh, background and all of that expertise to bear to this project. So we're, we're, we're very excited about how we can create more engaging real-world application systems built around things like hyperscale data centers and wireless avionics communication and LiDAR systems for self-driving cars. So we're, we're trying to create content that at the same time is, is both in, instructive in terms of the technology that we're trying to, uh, to teach our, our students about, as well as giving them a good sense of what type of real world applications the technologies are going to be useful for and having that be part of the game-based learning environment that they're going to be exploring. Hmm. So within the U.S., I understand there's sort of a skills gap for, for the technicians and engineers that work in manufacturing. Do you know how significant the skills gap is? Uh, so we are currently conducting an in industry survey about what the training needs different jobs would require, as well as how difficult it is for employers to find people to fill these, these jobs. And as we talk to more and more people, it's becoming very apparent that, especially in optics and photonics, these new and emerging fields, there really is no one on the technician level who's able to fill this role. So a lot of times they have equipment that they need someone who has an understanding of optics and photonics to be able to manage. The, but at the same time, they need their engineers on their team to be working on engineering tasks. So what they're finding and what we're, what we're exploring with our education roadmap that we're going to be developing over the course of the next year is they are finding that there's this skill gap that needs to be filled by somebody who will be working as a technician within the organization, but who also needs to understand a little bit more of the fundamentals behind optics and photonics. And so uh, we're, we're, we're calling this role a, a super technician, someone who has specialized training in this field. And we're, through our uh, surveying efforts, we're finding that this is actually a very big problem nationally, uh, that there are many areas of the country that are currently underserved and that are needing people to fill this skills gap. And uh, one of the main objectives that we have in this grant is to start by focusing on optics and photonics, which is an area we're very familiar with, and we know what kind of training is needed in those areas, and to then explore in other topics, in other advanced manufacturing areas, what other skills gaps exist and try to become a design house for creating interactive educational content in those areas. Okay. And this grant came from the Office of uh, Naval Research. So I'm assuming the Navy probably has an interest in, in addressing these kind of skill gaps as well. Right, right. The grant is, is administered by off the Office of Naval Research. Uh, and the DOD in general is funding a lot of activity around these fields in advanced manufacturing. In our case, it's around the field of integrated photonics. And one of the reasons that they're so interested in this is the, the application areas, there are many applications for military interests. So we have uh, data communication, we have RF or wireless communication, mostly going into 5G. We have LIDAR technologies uh, and also chemical sensing. So th they are actually quite interested in seeing this technology grow during the Obama administration 
they set up 14 Manufacturing USA institutes that would be focused on developing advanced manufacturing for many different fields, including robotics and integrated photonics and lightweight materials and additive materials. So a, a lot of these different areas, what, what they recognized was that they really needed a boost from government uh, funding and support to make sure that that advanced manufacturing was going to be coming to term and becoming a, a center point for U.S. advanced manufacturing and making sure that these jobs remain with, within the U.S. Okay. In terms of designing content for adults, which are the people who would mostly be using these tools, I imagine, um, versus kids, do you notice, are there big differences in terms of how you have to design those kind of games or, or training resources? Yeah, definitely. So uh, one of the main challenges that come up with trying to design content for, for children and for, for K-12, uh, it's more difficult to test your subjects. <laughs> so you, you have that issue of, of having to make sure that your research with human subjects receives a little bit more attention. Uh, and a lot of times children will need something that's a little bit more entertaining and engaging than adults will. You, adults are very motivated to learn the content a lot of the time. So you do have that advantage. Uh, however, you, you do have the fact that kids are normally digital natives, whereas adults are coming more as digital immigrants. So a lot of times you'll, uh, when you're trying to create educational content for adults, you do need to take that in mind and make sure that your the content that you're designing is intuitive to use and easy to use. Uh, so it, it puts a little bit more extra pressure and, and, and you can't necessarily rely on people being able to figure it out in the same way. You have to make sure that things are well designed for the adult learner. So in addition to design, are there other ways you can help adult learners sort of overcome the, the technological knowledge gaps they might have? Right. So we're, there actually is a, an interesting idea here that VR will make that easier. So a lot of times uh, adults have trouble using computers because they don't know necessarily like all of the, uh, the inherent like defaults <laughs> that a, that a mm -hmm. user interface has. Uh, so there's a lot of promise, and it's not there yet, but there's a lot of promise that as things become more and more intuitive to use in VR, uh, that we might be able to train an older population in a way that where they don't have to figure out how do you rotate around something to be able to see it from all sides. They can literally just tilt their head and, and figure out exactly how, and, and they don't have to necessarily use some user interface. We're just making it more and more intuitive and more and more uh, 3D in real world to allow them to use our technology in the way that they normally would. But there's that hope and desire. Uh, but it, of course, VR UI is still a work in progress. There are many different questions that are coming up as in how do you move around in VR if you don't have the capacity to, to have a full room that, that is VR compatible? How do you move around? Right now we have teleporting and other types of, of ways of getting around but it is a little clunky. So there are many questions to be answered about exactly what, what the final version of these types of tools will be and what types of UI will evolve to meet the needs of adult learners. Mm -hmm. So as like VR becomes more commercially available, like I think now you can go buy an Oculus Rift or whatever, right? Um, do you think that will sort of help solve these problems as industry and, and regular people get involved? Or do you think that some of these questions are things that need to be addressed more in sort of an academic or government research level? We definitely need more, uh, we need more research on how these tools are going to be used. And the technology does need to advance. Right now, it's you do have to wear something bulky as you're moving around. So at some point, we'll get to a point where it's as easy as putting on a pair of glasses and you're able to use VR or AR in your everyday life. And that's actually one of the most exciting things that we can be looking forward to. What does our workforce look like and how, what does workforce training look like in the future? One of the most uh, exciting ideas is that in order to enable lifelong learning, maybe when you are being trained to use some piece of equipment, you use a tool like AR or VR, uh, and then you find it so useful that you end up using it in your everyday life, in your, in your job. So as, as that person graduates from whatever program that's taught him how to or her how to use uh, this technology or this, or this uh, equipment, maybe when future updates need to be made to that training tool, maybe they are able to use that AR 
those AR glasses on the job and it can give them additional information about things that are that are occurring on the job. And whenever you need to be retrained on something, maybe that's just a notification that comes up saying, hey, do you want to be retrained on how to use this other piece of equipment that you might not have been trained mm-hmm. on before? So in a way, we can, in the future, use these training tools and have them invade the workforce itself so that people who are uh, uh, currently people who work in, in the field, they don't really, they can't really look up how to do their job very easily. So in an right. office job, we, we definitely have the ability to Google whatever it is that we're, we're trying to figure out. But if you're going to fix some piece of equipment out in the field, <laughs> a lot of times you either have to bring along the manual in paper form and look through it. it uh, at the moment, it's not really that useful to have some piece of technology to help you in that, in that context. But in the future, it might be. We might be able to create digital field manuals that allow you to use AR and VR, where they can point at the literal object and have arrows showing you what to do and what things to turn what knobs to turn on the on the equipment in order to to be able to do your job more effectively. So at that point, we'll have gone beyond this barrier of going to the classroom to learn something, and then at some point you stop learning, and then you become a, a person who's working out in the field. We'll have bridged that gap, and now Google will be available to everybody <laughs> who's working out in the field. Uh, and so it's not just going to be an office job advantage of being able to to look things up on the fly. Hopefully, that will eventually become something that the working uh, class will be able to uh, use in their everyday life as well. Yeah, that does seem exciting. I guess in my head, I'm imagining sort of like an Iron Man style, just like look at something and it like shows you all this info about it. Yeah, yeah. That's the dream is that we'll get to a point <laughs> where that's something that uh, can be used on on the fab floor for, let's say, a, a technician who's working in on a fab line uh, in the semiconductor industry. We'd be able to give them the tools that they can use in their job. And at that point, they will be able to be a lifelong learner and learn as they go to work every day. So I'm imagining in a system like that, it would require some pretty advanced like image recognition technology. Do you all currently work with people that work sort of in that field of image recognition or like machine learning, AI kind of stuff? So there's a lot of there are many groups on campus, uh, including CSAIL, who are working on the actual uh, programming and of, of how, how this will, will go. But uh, there's a lot of talk about the Internet of Things and how that will eventually transform our, our, our world. Uh, and so I think this is only going to accelerate, right? We're going to be uh, uh, expanding things out into, the, into this Internet of Things. The virtual and physical worlds will start to collide more and more. So I don't think this is that far away in terms of the... Uh, use case for this is already there and the public will demand it very, very quickly. And so th- I think we're, we're already going to be making progress in that direction. So there's no, uh, there's no inherent barrier to, to getting there. That's it for this episode of the podcast. We'll be back next week for part two of my interview with Eric Verlage. In that episode, we continue to discuss building educational games till next week. Peace.